The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked advance against me, it is my enemies and my foes who will stumble and fall. Though an army besiege me, my heart will not fear. Though war break out against me, even then I will be confident. For in the day of trouble, he will keep me safe in his dwelling. He will hide me in the shelter of his sacred tent and set me high upon a rock. Then my head will be exalted above the enemies who surround me. At his sacred tent, I will sacrifice with shouts of joy. I will sing and make music to the Lord. I remain confident of this. I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord, be strong, and take heart, and wait for the Lord. In John 14, 15, Jesus said, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. In Luke eleven twenty eight, 28, he said, blessed rather are those who hear the word of God and keep it. Matthew seven twenty one, he said, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my father who is in heaven. John 3.36, he said, whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life. John 14.21, he said, whoever has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me. Luke 6.46, he said, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do what I tell you? And of course, after his death and resurrection, Jesus summons his disciples to a mountain in Galilee where he gave them the now famous great commission, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. Matthew 28, 19 and 20. I, I think it's safe to say that Jesus took his commands very seriously. And he expected us to as well. When you consider the fact that all scripture is breathed out by God, 2 Timothy 3.16, and that Jesus himself is the word according to John 1, then what we're talking about really is a lifetime of learning as the Bible is full of commands about how to live and, and what to do and what not to do and how to treat others and how to please God and how to act according to his will, right? Everything Jesus wanted us to model our lives after is commanded all throughout the Bible, which, of course, is one of the reasons we teach through the Bible here verse by verse, because I just, I just simply don't want us to miss anything that he's saying to us. And yet, do you know that of all the commands given to us in the entire Bible, including the Ten Commandments, but not just those, when you include every single command given to God's people in all of biblical scripture, there is one command that is repeated vastly more than all the other commands. Of course, when you ask people what it is, most assume it has something to do with love, to, to love God or to love other people, but that's not it. No, the single most repeated command in all of the Bible by far is do not be afraid, which is repeated in one form or another hundreds of times, which is amazing when you consider the sheer volume of the commands of God in Scripture, right? Why is that one command given to us so much more than any other command? Well, first of all, it's because God knew that we were going to be afraid a lot. 
And secondly, it's because he wants us to stand against fear in our own lives. Okay, just like there's only, uh, just like there's only one righteous application for hate, right? To hate what is evil, Romans 12, 9. Likewise, there's only one righteous application for fear, to fear God, Matthew 10, 28. You understand, all other fear is sin. In fact, Proverbs 8, 13 ties the two together. It says, the fear of the Lord is hatred of evil. So the only thing you should ever hate is evil. And the only thing you should ever fear is God. But we get it backwards, don't we? I, I think that's our problem. We, we don't hate what is evil, and we don't fear God. And the result is we live our lives racked with fear over things we were never meant to be afraid of to begin with. Namely, everything this world is constantly telling us we should be afraid of, right? But here's the good news. You can break the cycle of fear in your own life and take back the peace and confidence that are a part of your inheritance as a child of God. You absolutely can, as we're going to see in this story today as we continue our sermon series working our way through 1 Samuel where the Israelites learned to fight fear with fear. They learn how to defeat the sinful fear of this world with a righteous fear of God, which is precisely what we need to learn in our own lives today. The fact that you can live your entire life without being afraid of all the things this world says you should be afraid of. Listen, viruses and vaccines, right? Government policies and politics, death and disease, terrorism and a terrible economy and rogue asteroids and low credit scores and teeth that aren't always white enough and melting glaciers and volcanoes under Yellowstone and on and on and on it goes. And look, listen, it's okay to pay attention to all of that, but it is not okay to live in fear of all of that. And if your life is in Christ, the best part is you don't have to. Can you imagine it? Just think about how free you would be to live your life the way God intended for you to live it if you didn't have to waste one more moment of your life being afraid. It's true. It's true. Let's pick the story back up where we left off last week and see why. If you're a child of God, you don't have to be afraid ever again. 1 Samuel chapter 11, we'll begin with the first four verses. Then Nahash the Ammonite went up and besieged Jabesh Gilead. And all the men of Jabesh said to Nahash, make a treaty with us and we will serve you. But Nahash the Ammonite said to them, on this condition I will make a treaty with you, that I gouge out all your right eyes and thus bring disgrace on all Israel. The elders of Jabesh said to him, Give us seven days' respite that we may send messengers through all the territory of Israel. Then if there's no one to save us, we will give ourselves up to you. When the messengers came to Gibeah of Saul, they reported the matter in the ears of the people, and all the people wept aloud. When uh, Moses appointed the land to Israel, the Reubenites, Gadites, and the half-tribe of Manasseh settled east uh, of the Jordan River, as described in Numbers 34 13 through 15. They're often referred to as the Transjordanian tribes. The, the Reubenites settled in uh, the region of Moab to the south, uh, east of the Dead Sea. The half tribe of Manasseh settled to the north, southeast of the Sea of Galilee. And the Gadites settled in the region between the two, between Reuben and, and Manasseh. But all you really need to remember about that is the fact that the Reubenites and Gadites were much closer to Nahash and the Ammonites than the residents of Jabesh Gilead, who were in the half-tribe of Manasseh, way up there in the north, which we'll come back to in a moment. And although the Ammonites were related to Israel, as we'll, uh, we see back in Genesis uh, 1938, also Deuteronomy 219, they were generally hostile toward the Transjordanian tribes of the Israelites because the Ammonites believed that the east bank of the Jordan belonged to them, as seen in Judges 11. 12 and 13. And so Nahash, the Amorite king, feels entitled to these territories because they formerly belonged to his ancestors. And so the story opens up. Nahash, the Ammonite, went up and besieged Jabesh Gilead. 
which seems odd to randomly travel that far north to besiege Jabesh Gilead when you have to go through the Reubenites and Gadites to get there. And this is where the story really gets interesting. Because in the Qumran, the Dead Sea Scrolls, there is an entire chunk of additional information about this story, which is also attested to by Flavius Josephus, the first century Jewish historian in his work, Antiquities of the Jews, where we're told that Nahash had already been oppressing the Reubenites and Gadites and had already gouged out their right eyes because the vast majority uh, of fighting men were right-handed, which meant they held their shield in their left hand, right, shielding their head from attack in battle, only peering around the edge of the shield with their right eye. So, so take out the right eye, and you've taken out the ability for most men to fight ever again. He was rendering their entire armies permanently useless, and according to the Dead Sea Scrolls, he'd been at it for some time now, already conquering much of the Transjordanian tribes, except for the fact that 7,000 Reubenite and Gadite men had escaped and fled to Jabesh Gilead. And because the inhabitants of Jabesh Gilead were harboring these other Israelites who were fleeing Nahash, they too had become his enemies, which, which makes far more sense in not only understanding the reason Nahash shows up in Jabesh Gilead to begin with, demanding the right eye of all their men, but also it's, it makes sense in understanding the fear the sheer terror of the residents of Jabesh Gilead because there were 7,000 Israelite warriors shaking in their sandals who just came running into town telling of the horrors of Nahash and what he'd already done to their countrymen. And just to add to that fear, there was a long history dating back to the book of Judges of uh, non-participation between the eastern and western tribes in battle, even against common enemies. And so knowing that the eastern tribes had already been mostly decimated by Nahash, the residents of Jabesh Gilead had little reason for hope. Now, listen, the name Nahash in the ancient Hebrew means serpent or snake. That's not a coincidence. Nahash, the enemy, represents Satan in this story, and Saul, as we'll see, represents Jesus the king, And no sooner does Nahash stroll into town that the residents of Jabesh Gilead try to make a deal with the devil. Make a treaty with us and we will serve you. Remember, they, in the last chapter, they just made Saul their king. But they're so afraid of the enemy that they're willing to serve him if he promises to be peaceable toward them. And then when he tells them the price of peace, the right eye of every man, in other words, their total submission to him, they ask him for seven days respite, a seven-day pause to allow them time to make one last-ditch effort to find someone, anyone west of the Jordan who might be willing to help them. And it's significant that they make no mention whatsoever of their newly appointed king, Saul. You know why? Because at this point, their fear of the enemy is greater than their confidence in their own king because they haven't yet learned to fear, to respect their own king, which is surprising, but not nearly as surprising as the fact that Nahash agrees to their terms. Right? Why? Why would you do that? Why not go ahead and force them to submit right now without someone to save them. This is an otherwise hopeless situation. And because of it, they're ready to give themselves over to the enemy because they can't see a way out, which is exactly, by the way, what the enemy wants you to feel, like you have no hope, no way out of your circumstances, that you'll never have victory over or freedom from fear in your life. And his greatest desire is to blind you with that lie to keep you right where you are, defeated, afraid, and powerless. So why not force them to submit to him right now when he has them right where he wants them? It's because Nahash represents Satan. And listen, Satan cannot exercise any control over you without your agreement. Okay? Don't be afraid of the enemy. Do you, you understand? The only control he has over you if you're a child of God is that which you give him. Listen, James, the brother of Jesus, said, resist the devil and he might flee from you. 
No, that's not what he said. He said, resist the devil, and he should flee from you. Now, he didn't say that either. He said, resist the devil, and hopefully he'll flee from you. That's not what he said. James said, resist the devil, and he will flee from you, James 4, 7. David said, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you're with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me. God prepares a table before me. Where? In the presence of my enemies. Psalm 23, 4 and 5. That is profoundly important because God's goal isn't always to whisk you away from trouble. No, it's to teach you not to be afraid in the midst of your trouble because he's with you and he's greater than all the trouble in this world combined. So don't be afraid of the enemy. He has no power over you unless you submit yourself to him as we see in this story as the Israelites are running scared, trying to make a deal with Nahash instead of immediately going straight to their king and calling on him to deliver them. Why? It's the same reason we submit to fear in our lives today instead of turning to Jesus because we have more faith in what we think the enemy can do to us than what our king can do through us. Proverbs 1 7 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, depending on what translation you have. It might say wisdom or understanding. It's the ancient Hebrew word yira. It means reverence or respect. It refers to an awe struck wonder, a profound respect, a reverence for the Almighty, all powerful, all knowing, all seeing, all present and everlasting God. It is a humble submission before Him, which is foundational to the attainment of real understanding, wisdom, knowledge. It is a constructive and instructive and preserving fear that every single child of God should have. And yet, so often we submit to the threats of the enemy. Because we fear him more than we fear God. Don't believe me. Listen. If you don't actively, intentionally proclaim the gospel of Christ in your life. In fact, if you're not pursuing the lost with all that Jesus commanded us. If you're not going after unbelievers for Christ because you're more concerned with people's approval than you are with their souls. Then you fear the ruler of this world more than you fear the king of kings and lord of lords. If you're unable to trust God with your difficult circumstances to the point that you cannot stop worrying about what might happen next, then you fear the plans of the enemy more than the power of God to overcome the enemy. If you're more interested in what you can gain in this life than what you can gain in the next by giving away what you have in this life, then I'm telling you, you fear the enemy's lie that you'll never have enough more than you revere the promise of God to give you far more than you could ask or think when you look to him for your every need instead of to this world. And listen, it doesn't have to be that way. In fact, it's not supposed to be that way. You can break the cycle of fear in your own life, but it's a conscious effort that you have to make. You have to actually retrain your response to fear so that every time you find yourself in the grip of fear, instead of resigning yourself to it or running scared from it, instead you run headlong to Christ and you let him lead you through it. That's not intuitive, by the way. I understand that's not our natural response. In fact, it is a supernatural response, one that we have to train ourselves to follow through with consistently. But listen, the more you do that, the more you will come to understand and accept that no matter what the enemy ever tries to do in your life, you don't have to be afraid because the one you are with is greater than all of your fears. So you understand Uh, fear is actually not the enemy. It's where you direct it and how you deal with it that either shapes you or breaks you. Christian counselor and author Craig Lounsbro once said, one man lives out his life beating his fears into submission 
while another lives out his life, letting his fears beat him into submission. And while the fears are the same, the kind of men that they produce are not. Let's keep reading, verses 5 through 11. Now behold, Saul was coming from the field behind the oxen, and Saul said, What is wrong with the people that they're weeping? So they told him the news of the men of Jabesh, and the Spirit of God rushed upon Saul when he heard these words, and his anger was greatly kindled. He took a yoke of oxen and cut them in pieces and sent them throughout all the territory of Israel by the hand of the messengers, saying, Whoever does not come out after Saul and Samuel, so shall it be done to his oxen. Then the dread of the Lord fell upon the people, and they came out as one man. When he mustered them at Bezek, the people of Israel were 300,000, and the men of Judah 30,000. And they said to the messengers who had come, Thus shall you say to the men of Jabesh-Gilead, Tomorrow, by the time the sun is hot, you shall have salvation. When the messengers came and told the men of Jabesh, they were glad. Therefore, the men of Jabesh said, tomorrow, they're talking to Nahash now, tomorrow we will give ourselves up to you. and You may do to us whatever seems good to you. And the next day, Saul put the people in three companies and they came into the midst of the camp in the morning watch and struck down the Ammonites until the heat of the day. And those who survived were scattered so that no two of them were left together. Seven days is barely enough time for the messengers to reach all the land of Israel and return with an answer for Nahash. In fact, Gibeah alone was uh, 42 miles. Samuel's hometown was 42 miles from Jabesh Gilead. So an uh, 84-mile round trip on foot through rough terrain, right? And yet they make it through much of the territory, including Gibeah. And we know from Judges 21 that there were blood ties between the tribe of Benjamin, Saul's tribe at Gibeah, and Jabesh Gilead. There was intermarriage between them, which probably is why we don't read anything about lamenting or weeping or sorrow from any of the other tribes as this message is spread. While the people of Gibeah were weeping at the news of Jabesh being under siege because these were their close relatives, right? So all the people of Gibeah are mourning the imminent defeat and subjugation of their kin at Jabesh. Notice there is zero confidence, however, at this point in the story, there's zero confidence in Saul to do anything about it, even in his own hometown. And then Saul reenters the story as he's coming from behind the field, from behind the oxen. In other words, Saul's out on his dad's farm driving the oxen. It speaks so uh, much to the humility of Saul at this early stage of his reign as king. He is the king of Israel. And what is he found doing? He's out in the fields, faithfully serving his father. It's such a beautiful picture of Jesus, our king, who took on human flesh to humbly and faithfully serve the will of the father. And as he comes back into town from the fields, he sees everybody weeping and he says, hey, what's going on? And as soon as they tell him, about Jabesh. The Spirit of God rushed upon Saul when he heard these words. His anger was greatly kindled. He took a yoke of oxen, that's a pair of oxen, and he cuts them in pieces. And he sends them out through all the territory of Israel by the hand of the messengers, saying, Whoever does not come out after Saul and Samuel, so shall it be done to his oxen. The message was clear. Their new king wasn't afraid of a fight, and he didn't expect them to be either. And what was the response of the people in this pivotal moment? The dread of the Lord fell upon the people and they came out as one man. Their response was fear. But this time, it was a healthy, reverent, awestruck fear and a righteous respect for their king. You see, most people read this story and they think the turning point for the Israelites was their victory over Nahash. Not so at all. No, the critical turning point for the people of God was this moment right here. The moment they traded their fear of what the enemy could do to them in battle for an awestruck wonder over what their king was promising to do through them in battle if they would just submit to him instead of submitting to the enemy. And listen, when your fear, when your respect for God 
for what he's able to do becomes greater than your fear or your respect for what the enemy can do. I'm telling you, the battle ahead of you no longer seems so overwhelming because you have a new understanding. Remember, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of understanding, wisdom, knowledge, right? And it is that healthy, righteous fear of their king that rallied the Israelites to the battlefield and ultimately to a decisive victory, okay? Do not be afraid of the battle. Listen, when you fear God's ability more than you fear the enemy's ability, the battles you face in this life are no longer obstacles to becoming the man or woman of God he created you to be. They actually become necessary steps in becoming the man or woman of God he created you to be, which was the case with the Israelites, as we're going to see. Okay, If if they had uh, surrendered to Nahash because the battle seemed too overwhelming for them, What would have happened? He would have blinded them, subjugated them, and controlled them so they could never again be effective on the battlefield or anywhere else for that matter. They'd never be able to live up to their potential as God's chosen people. And what would have been their reward for surrendering to the enemy? They would have avoided a fight. They would have stayed out of a battle. That's it. And yet as soon as they answer the call to battle, because they feared what their king could do more than they feared what the enemy could do. Listen, uh, the battle wasn't easy. They still had to go out and fight. They still had to go to war. They still had to do the work to defeat the enemy. But the result was a renewal, as we see, a strengthening of God's people in his kingdom. Listen, the battle wasn't easy, but it also didn't make them weak. No, it made them strong. And do you know that is exactly why the battles you're facing in life today are necessary. It's not to wear you down, but to make you stronger. Doesn't mean they'll be easy. They never are. But Jesus didn't call you to an easy life. He called you to a victorious life. And listen to me. You cannot have a victory without a battle. You cannot have a victory without a battle. You see, the enemy will gladly leave you at peace as long as you agree not to do battle with him. As long as you submit your life to his demands, he will be more than happy to leave you be half blind, defeated, feckless, unable to help anyone ever and perpetually live in fear. But that's not the life God created you for. The apostle Paul said, if God is for us, Who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. How will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died more than that who was raised, who's at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. It's you and me. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword as it is written? For your sake we're being killed all the day long. We're regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, in other words, in all these battles with the enemy, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Romans 8, 31 through 37. You understand what Paul's saying? All throughout your life as a follower of Christ, there are going to be times when you're going to face battles, whether it's extremely difficult circumstances, tribulation or distress, seemingly hopeless situations, right? Persecution, other people directly coming against you. Maybe it's a lack of what you need or, or a real danger, even violence for some, all of which Paul experienced. And yet he says, don't you ever run away from something the Lord intends to lead you through. You hear me? Don't ever run away from something the Lord intends to lead you through. No matter how difficult it may be, not only because God is greater than anything and everything this world can ever come against you with, but also because you'll be stronger in the end for having gone through the battle with him, which is the key. 
It's the key to every battle you'll ever have to fight in your life. As long as you're with Jesus Christ, the King of Kings, you don't have to be afraid. Pastor and author Bob Sorg said, it's not the fire that changes you, but your pursuit of God in the fire that changes you. Let's finish the story for today. Verse 12 to the end of the chapter. Then the people said to Samuel, who is it that said, shall Saul reign over us? Bring the men that we may put them to death. But Saul said, not a man shall be put to death this day, for today the Lord has worked salvation in Israel. Then Samuel said to the people, come, let us go to Gilgal and there renew the kingdom. So all the people went to Gilgal and there they made Saul king before the Lord in Gilgal. There they sacrificed peace offerings before the Lord and there Saul and all the men of Israel rejoiced greatly. So the victory is secure. They're about to hold a religious coronation for Saul as their king. Just to be clear, he was already privately anointed uh, as king by Samuel in the beginning of chapter 10 and then politically appointed as king by Lot before the people at the end of chapter 10. And so this final step at Gilgal is largely ceremonial to recognize before God in a more formal way what has already been done. But before they do that, the first thing on the minds of the people is, who is it that said, Saul shall reign over us? Bring those men here that we may put them to death. If you were here last week, you'll remember at Saul's appointment as king, there were some worthless fellows, as chapter 10, verse 27 describes them, who despised Saul, questioning his ability to reign as king, and therefore they refused to recognize him as such. And so now the rest of the Israelites who have just experienced Saul's masterful battle planning, his military execution, his ability to rally the troops, securing a great victory over their enemy. They're ready to hunt down every last one of Saul's detractors and kill them. Why? Because they're afraid. Now that they finally have the king they've always wanted, they're afraid of any outcome, anyone or anything that might be a threat. And so they're ready to take matters into their own hands until Saul says, no, no, you let me worry about that. That's not your decision to make. But that's exactly what we do, isn't it? When we perceive anything as producing a different outcome than the one we want in whatever circumstances we're facing, we kill it as fast as we can. Whether that's a relationship, a business or professional transaction, an, an encounter or agreement with another person, listen, a personal conviction, I mean, decisions of just about every stripe, whatever it is, we fear outcomes that are unfavorable, and so we try to control every aspect of our circumstances as much as possible, eliminating whatever is necessary along the way to try and determine a favorable outcome. It's an exhausting way to live your life, and it will keep you in fear of possible outcomes that you have no control over anyway. It's a miserable way to live your life. So look, if you're actively following Christ in your life, even when through tremendous struggles, don't be afraid of the outcome. Don't try to control every outcome in your life because ultimately the outcome is beyond your control anyway. All right, listen. Look, at the end of the day, uh, all fear is about loss. If you think about what it is you fear, and you follow that fear to its logical conclusion, it is always about loss. Loss of health, loss of a relationship, loss of status, loss of authority, loss of acceptance, loss of position, loss of money or material things, loss of freedom, right? Loss of whatever it is you're wanting to hold on to. And on and on it goes. Everything that we're afraid of is related ultimately to losing something. That's why the Apostle John said, perfect love casts out fear, for fear has to do with punishment. 1 John 4, 18. It's the ancient Greek word kalasis, which can also be translated as penalty. In other words, something we stand to lose. And the reason perfect love is the anecdote to loss is because perfect love can only be found in one place, Jesus Christ. And when your life is in perfect relationship to Christ, I'm telling you, the fear of loss goes away. Certainly it does in terms of eternal life because of what 
Jesus did for us on the cross, but it's also true in the here and now because in Christ you have everything that you need for this life and the next. Of course, uh, because of our humanity, we're not yet perfected in him. And as a result, we, we really like to hang on so tightly sometimes to what we have, even though the tighter our grip on what we think we possess, the more fear grips our heart because we're afraid to lose what we have. And so we try to control the outcome. And I'm just telling you, it's all a facade. This idea that we own, that we possess anything, it's a facade because God is sovereign over all of it. And at the end of the day, it all belongs to him. And anything good that we think we own, any respect, any authority, any position or influence that we think we may have somehow earned in truth, it all comes from him. And in the end, it all goes back to him. So look, just stop holding on so tightly to what we think we have a right to because our entire future, everything good that we may ever achieve or obtain, any noble aspiration, the fulfillment of every dream, all promise for the future for every single believer, it is wholly found in Jesus Christ alone. Some of us uh, were worrying about a virus. Some of us are worrying about losing our way of life. Some of us are worrying about losing income and money. Some are worrying about losing possessions. Some are worrying about losing our jobs. Others are worrying about losing relationships. And again, uh, I'm not minimalizing any of that. The fact is what concerns you concerns the Father. Jesus himself said, Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? And not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your Father. Matthew 10, 29. Do you understand that is the profound concern and ultimate sovereignty of God summed up in one verse. He's concerned with and in control of every single detail of your life, which is why we can give every outcome that concerns us to him because he knows far better how it's all going to work out in the end than we could ever hope to. So, so what do we do? Uh, when a relationship, for instance, in our life is falling apart, we give it to God. The hurt, the emotion, the confusion, the questions, give all of that to God. Stop clinging so tightly to something that you cannot control and do not own. He owns it all, and he's very much in control, and it's the same with every other area of our lives. Every outcome that we fear, we have to let go of and give it to him. We have to stop clinging to the kingdoms of men, this illusion that somehow we've built this life for ourselves and we have the final say as long as we don't make too many mistakes and work really hard, we can control the outcome. Sorry, <laughs> you can't because that's not how it works. God is in control, which means he alone controls the outcomes. And yet we get so obsessed sometimes with our own little kingdoms this life that we believe we've, we've built for ourselves when in reality, God wrote this entire story long before you or I were born. And so he's, he's not confused, right? He's not surprised about anything. He knows what's getting ready to happen in your life and how it's all going to turn out in the end. Just keep in mind that Saul represents Jesus in the story. And notice what he said to the Israelites long before the battle ever took place. Thus shall you say to the men of Jabesh Gilead, tomorrow, by the time the sun is hot, you shall have salvation. And that is exactly what happened. Why? Because he knows every outcome in your life, which means you don't have to be afraid. Missionary and author Elizabeth Elliot once said, fear arises when we imagine that everything depends on us. You see, when you stop being afraid, afraid of the enemy, afraid of the battles, right? afraid of the outcomes, things you think you might lose, when you stop being afraid, your entire paradigm for living in this world changes. It does. You begin to see the world and your life in it differently. 
You take risks that you never would have considered before. You, you seize moments and master fears that you never thought you could before. You stand up and stand against evil in this world in ways you never knew you were capable of. Can you imagine it? How free you would be to live your life the way God intended for you to live it if you didn't have to waste one more moment of your life being afraid of all the things this world says you should be afraid of. Well, you can. You can break the cycle of fear in your own life and take back the peace and confidence that are a part of your inheritance as a child of God. It starts when you fear him when you revere Jesus Christ more than you fear the enemy or anything else in this world. That is the beginning of wisdom. Then you follow Jesus straight into battle. Whatever it is, whatever battles you face in this life, you face them head on with Jesus leading the way and trusting every single outcome to him. Is it going to be easy? No, it won't be easy. In fact, you'll have to retrain your response to fear. Instead of running away from the battle, you have to run to Jesus in prayer. You let him lead you through it every single step of the way, abiding in his perfect love all along the way, which isn't always easy. But listen, he didn't call you to live an easy life. He called you to live a fearless one. A life where you don't have to be afraid ever again. Let's pray.